Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Good to see you all. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, today's presentation by Matthew Milborn um, on, on Hortense Spillers. Um, I'll just remind everyone, uh, I mean, I think everyone knows this by now, but our uh, Palestine issue is um, available to be ordered. All of the proceeds from that are going to the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. Um, and the the essays that are contained within that issue are available and um, can be read online. Um, but if you want a physical copy, it's, it's very beautiful. Um, and it is uh, in complete support of um, the, the mental health program in Gaza. Um, so also to preview um, next week and maybe even just the rest of the seminar since we're, we're kind of toward the end. Um, next week we have Gabriel Wynan uh, who will be presenting on Arlie Russell Hostchild and Managed Heart. Um, and though that reading is in the um, Google Drive and then we have um, Patricia Garabici on psychoanalysis in class, reading to be announced. And then our final week, we have Samo Tomsic. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's been um, wonderful to, to think with you guys uh, up until this point. And I think the next few weeks will be really wonderful. Um, Okay, so I'm going to introduce Matthew, who I'm I'm so uh, happy to have with us today. Uh, Matthew is an interdisciplinary scholar working at the intersections of Black literary and cultural studies. Uh, he's based in Berlin and previously studied politics and economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and North American and African American Studies at the Free University of Berlin. He's currently a fourth year doctoral candidate in the Department of English at Vanderbilt University, where he's writing a dissertation on the anti-political Black cultures of Black British radicalism. And uh, Matthew is also um, the last official graduate student of Hortense Spillers, who we're reading today, um, and is approaching the material to that position. So, um, Matthew, thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Um, it's uh, it's always a, um, a sort of daunting um, uh, uh, predicament to try and uh, present on um, what then spillers his work to to, to any um, community of, of thinkers or scholars, um, uh, in, in part because their work is so so rich. Um, so one always feels as though one, one wants to be sort of adequate to the challenge of trying to to um, um, sort of reproduce the complexities of her thought. Um, as well as the, the kind of richness of our language. Um, in a way, I think one, one will always fail in a sense to be commensurate to that. Um, and I think for me, you know, there's this sort of other aspect to, to thinking with, um, thinking with her work and trying to speak about it, which is this kind of um, uh, personal relationship that I've, I've developed with her. Um, you know, so there's a certain kind of pressure, I think, to try and sort of balance those two, those two competing um, elements to it. Um, I should also say that uh, that kind of intimacy, in a way, um, is um, is somehow both, I think, a function of the way in which she thinks and in the way in which she writes, um, which I'm going to try and tease out a little bit. Um, but it's it's also a key element for me in terms of thinking about the idea of, of um, her, her overall project. Um, the, the project I think that she would probably describe as the project of Black Studies um, or Black Culture more, more generally. Um, I will say at the very beginning um, that, you know, in some ways probably I ought to refer to her as Professor Spillers, um, but the kind of peculiarity of my own um, introduction to her was on the one hand through her texts. I read her texts first. Um, I came to her work primarily firstly through through her, her written material. And then I got the opportunity to to, to study with her. Um, but she retired um, the the officially retired the year that I started studying um, with her. So all of the kind of interactions that I had at the very beginning um, were not in the classroom. Um, they weren't 
um, in a sense, in a kind of structured space where there is an authority um, figure that that I have to sort of reckon with, and that would be you know, Professor Spillers. Um, it was in an independent um, study um, setting, um, an intimate setting. It was at her house in her living room, um, and I've come to call that sort of reading with with, with Hortons. Um, so I find myself sort of referring to it as Hortons, and I hope you you understand that in a way that just reflects that particular dynamic. Um, it's it's uh, not meant to sort of show any any lack of respect for her uh, scholarship, um, but I think in in that instance today for, for for what we're thinking with in terms of this particular essay, all the things you could be now if if Sigma Freud's wife was your was your mother, um, is there is this kind of doubleness that she constantly sort of refers to? Um, there's a duality there. Um, there are different registers that I think that, that come through that she's both producing in the text and and sort of attempting to theorize. Um, if she refers to it as the double in, in, in one instance or the one in the other, um, if she talks about it in terms of this interior intersubjectivity, um, I think for me, my own approach to, to that kind of complication is in a way this dis distinction between spillers and hortons. Um, and what that might authorize. Um, I I hope that's kind of clear. Um, again, thank you for for, for inviting me. It's a, again a pleasure, but, but, but a daunting one. Um, I haven't um, prepared a um, a presentation that I'm going to read from. Um, hopefully, I can sort of lay out a few a few primary kind of concerns um, or a kind of itinerary through which we can read. Um, together this text um, and um, I think from what Wendy told me I've got roughly 20, 20 minutes I think so um, then we can open up and, and we can you don't have to pay attention too much to time though just yeah okay um, and then we can have, yeah I think we can sort of get, get into it um, I think the first thing to say would be you know there, there is there is a question of, of how to read this text um and i think that question sort of first emerges for me in its in its difficulty um this is probably one of the, the more difficult texts i think of, of all times but it even arises in, in the immediacy of, of the of the title all the things you could be by now if sigmund freud's wife was your mother psychoanalyst psychoanalysis and and race um and when I was rereading this text to to sort of um, speak to it, speak to all of you, um, I was kind of again amazed at this kind of strange fe uh, feeling that I have when I'm when I'm reading her. And it is something like a kind of um, complex sending um, that I think I experience. She uh, Hortense sort of jokingly says that. Um, when she was trying to read R.A. Judy's um, most recent book, Sentient Flesh, um, which I don't know if anyone's tried, tried to read um, here. Um, it's a very difficult book. He presented for us and it was very difficult. Okay. Yeah, it was very good, okay. but very different, yeah. Did, did, he present, did he present from Sentient Flesh? Um, a bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, We we read that together, um, Hortense, myself, and a few others. Um, and you know, she jokingly said in a, in a very tongue-in-cheek way, um, in his presence, this is not a book that you read, but a book that you visit. Um, and you know, when I think about that in relation to to the difficulty of, of Hortense's work, trying to sort of formulate some kind of answer to that, I think this text somehow gives you gives me a kind of language to to think that out. Um, and it's this idea of, of, of sending. Um, there's, a, there's a way in which, you know, when, when I reread this text, it was as if I was rereading for the first time. Um, and what that means for me is I get this feeling of, of, of encountering something that's being sent. There's a kind of sending there. Um, she talks about um, a phrase similar to this. In, in some of the sections where she's referring to um, her relationship with the church and 
been sitting in the pews and, and, and listening to um, the the pastor. Um, this idea of, of, of something being sent, sending oneself um, uh, in one's place. Um, but I think there's a kind of broader way in which I want to understand this, and I think that that for me is a kind of interesting encounter where the 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 freshness and the newness of the text every time you read it um, is kind of a complex doubling of of something being sent, um, as well as one feeling as though you're 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 being asked um, to go somewhere as well. That my reaction to the text is 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 in a way feeling as though I'm being sent somewhere, um, and it's it's a kind of it's a kind of complex balance between the formulations that I think she's trying to work through. It's also in the language. And I think for me, um, one has to sort of pay attention to both of those at the same time. Um, the, the kind of slipperiness of the language is both a commentary on and, a, and an expression of something that I think she's trying to get at um, throughout this text. Um, it happens at that kind of du double double register. Um, so you have this idea of the double, um, I think that it sort of runs throughout the text. And if we, if we think about the double um, in relationship to the, to the title, um, I, I think for me, there's a way in which there's a kind of balance of forces that, that, that already announce itself. Um, those balance of forces would be maybe between, on the one hand, the thematics of race and psychoanalysis, um, where the essay starts in a way, but it also registers at the level of all the things. I would previously, when I was reading this this essay, and this is something that's come, come new to me, I, I previously read it as, when I referred to it, I always referred to it as psychoanalysis and race as a shorthand. But I think what I've come to understand is that these two things are juxtaposed. You know, she introduces the text in a, in a way of thinking about the contradictions or the, the juxtaposition between race and psychoanalysis. And I think that's definitely true. Um, but next to that, I think there's another juxtaposition. I think that juxtaposition is an ounce in the title. And that would be how to think the juxtaposition between all the things on the one hand and psychoanalysis and race on the other. Um, they are, of course, somehow overlapping. Um, um, they are sort of internally divided between each other. Um, but sort of coming back to this question of what might be a kind of protocol of reading um, this text with the notion of being sent and sending and the doubleness of it. Um, I, I think we have a, a few kind of options available to us. One of them would be to play it safe in a way. Um, and I think um, I might have good reason to, to, to do that in this instance, but that will be to see that there is an equality between the thematics of psychoanalysis and race on the one hand and what she's trying to get at when she's referring to all the things. Um, if one weren't to play it safe, if one were to be a little bit reckless, I think in one's, in one's uh, um, reading, you could say that the, the thematics of race and psychoanalysis are actually subordinate to all the things. Or rather, that the the former are the itinerary through which I think Hortens can approach the latter. Um, the the essay starts with race, then moves on to psychoanalysis, and then moves in quite sort of interesting, complex ways. But it ends, I think, you know, in some ways, um, with her description of where she gets the title from, um, and I think that kind of movement, that itinerary. Um, is something I think for me is is uh, important to hold on to, um, and it sort of points to the kind of framework within which I think this text can be read um, at the level of a kind of project. 
um, what would be her kind of overarching project in the essay, what would be the overarching project that this essay sits into in relation to some of the other texts that I think I would, I would sort of group it together with. Um, um, the kind of late work that I think she, she's engaging in. Um, the crisis of a Negro intellectual post-date um, and the idea of black culture. These are the three um, key um, uh, late essays I think are kind of grouped together for me within a certain kind of project. And I find this distinction between psychoanalysis and race on the one hand and all the things on the other um, to be um, productive in trying to understand those, those, those connections. Um, All the things as a as a title um, taken from a from a Mingus um, the title of a Mingus track um, acts for me as a kind of stand in um, possibly a kind of stand in for a certain style of listening uh, I think um, or a certain kind of attention to black life. I think Hortense might call this concern for black life a concern for the intramural. Um, it's not a term that's that's used a lot in this particular paper, but I think um, it runs alongside her use of the of the term interior intersubjectivity, um, which I think is her way of trying to talk about black culture. Um, which is also a way of, of trying to talk about black studies. Um, and if, in a way, black culture and black studies are always potentially thought to one side of the situation within which black life, black life has lived out. Um, if we were to translate this distinction that I'm trying to sort of work with um, um, into the kind of language of contemporary black critical discourse, I think we could talk about it in terms of the entangle entanglement or the predicament or crisis between blackness and anti-blackness. Um, and in a way, though this essay is now 30 years old, I think, um, or approaching that, it's useful in, in trying to understand, I think, some of the kind of more or less contemporary debates within black black studies. Um, we have, I think, in a way, a kind of choice to to be made, um, and I think it's a choice that that is, in some ways, subtle but significant. Um, and in this instance, I think it would be to say. If there is an entanglement or a predicament or a crisis between blackness and anti-blackness, um, which would be a way of rephrasing this distinction or this difference or this doubling between psychoanalysis and race on the one hand and all the things on, on the other. Um, if there is a crisis because they're entangled, um, we have to pay attention to both, right? Um, there is a kind of sustained attention to both of those elements. Um, I think she's interested in using psychoanalysis, the protocols of psychoanalysis, though in a kind of reformed, um, modified um, way, um, and, and using it as a way to think race and vice versa. Um, this to me, I think, is, is her way of being able to sort of approach more broadly speaking, the, the situation of anti-blackness. And she has to pay attention to that. Um, one has to be uh, vigilant towards it. And I think there's elements in this essay where, where the kind of urgency of having to be vigilant towards anti-blackness comes out. Um, but I think the value of her contribution in, in, in many ways is not only the the ways in which she complicates our notion of race and complicates our notion um, of, of the kind of situation of black life, um, the anti-blackness within which black life has had to sort of um, develop practices of, of, of survival and, and persistence and preservation. 
um, you know, what she might call the kind of the terror of the Middle Passage or the, the brutality of enslavement, um, histories written in blood, um, capture, exile, social death, uh, enfleshment, um, and all the ways in which these are kind of foundational to the to the the terms of order of the the new world. Um, this essay performs that for us, I think, as well. Um, I actually don't think. I actually don't think that's what she's sort of really getting at in this paper, what she's really after. Um, and this requirement to pay attention to both also sort of registers a, a requirement to choose. Um, is one primarily going to be concerned with the questions of anti-blackness on the one hand, or would, and therefore also having to think about blackness as well, um, black life, or is one really trying to get at black life, what she calls the black life world. Um, and as a result of that, having to think through the kind of complications of anti-blackness. Um, in a way, I think what I what I find interesting in this paper is, is the, the sections where she's reading Fanon. Um, and I don't know how other people felt it, but um, she's kind of rough with him in a way. Uh, the, the reading with, with Fanon is, 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 is critical. Um, um, there's a certain kind of tone that she takes with, with Fanon um, that she, she doesn't quite take with Du Bois. Um, and, and one of the questions you could ask is, you know, how, how is she kind of thinking through Fanon? How is she pushing against Fanon, pushing back at some of his formulations? Um, and to do that, I think we could probably think about the, the, the notion of Negrophobogenesis specifically. Um, and, and where she's, I think, trying to sort of complicate that, that notion in relationship to, to a kind of black um, disposition. Um, but, but in a way, I think it's also to say, at times, I think she, she believes Fanon to be um, falling on the other side of that kind of distinction, falling on, on the side of anti-blackness rather than blackness. Um, and his, his kind of, um, is it a refusal? Is it a, is it, um, a lack and inability, um, an oversight? Um, in attending to the, the the kind of the resources that might be available within within something like a kind of complex intramural intramurality um, that I think she's kind of trying to work at actually um, and this I think is one of the kind of fault lines that appears on the page vis-a-vis -vis Fanon and 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 and, and Spinner's Fanon and Hortense despite the fact that she returns to Fanon at the, to Fanon at the end um, and kind of in a kind of really interesting self, self reflexive self-critical way um, offers a kind of return. Um, um, if, there's, if there's a way in which there's a kind of breach that happens between these two, two, two thinkers in the text, there's a kind of fusion that happens at the end, which I also find, find interesting. And maybe it is also a kind of instantiation of the kind of, um, critical self-reflection um, that she's she's trying to think under under the term of, of the one um, which which we can definitely get into um, but I you know I I find this distinction um, I find this distinction sort of necessary in a way and I think you know I, I know that Fred Moten has, has, has spoken to the group and he mentioned Ari Judy and um, the the kind of questions around what do we make of black life? What do we make of blackness? Um, um, how does it relate to normativity? Um, it is a position from which something might be described as lacking. Um, is it a deviation from, um, is it a question that deviates at the level of ontology or not? Um, what would be the kind of practices of, of, of responding to those conditions? Um, I think this this work, Hortense's work in general, this essay as well, um, gives me some kind of protocol to think think that out. And I think for me, 
and my own relationship to this work and her in general is about opening myself up to how to think this thing that she would call black culture or black studies in relationship to black culture. Um, and it is this attention to the intramural. Um, what am I doing for time? Okay. Um, once, once we can sort of start to get there, I think we can ask different, a, a different set of questions, maybe different questions that would be foreclosed otherwise. Um, and I think we can start to say, you know, what does it mean and how do we feel um, about ourselves in and through each other, um, in and through a kind of unequally entangled modality uh, or, or the, 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 the unequally entangled modalities rather through which um, the black communities lived. Um, my claim, if I'm, if I were to sort of um, speak for, speak for myself in this instance, my claim would be that um, we lose something when we either project into discourse a unified, undifferentiated notion of community. And if, in this essay, she's she's critiquing some some notion of a unified or undifferentiated subject, the individual. I think she also thinks about that in relation to the community. Um, it's not just the individual that I think can fall, fall, fall prey to, to the, the notion of the homogenous um, or the desire for homogeneity um, for the same, um, to sort of all be on the same page, so to speak. Um, it, it's also the community, it's also the group. Um, so I think we, you know, we, we definitely lose something when we when we sort of give into the sort of idea of the undifferentiated notion of the community or the black subject and or individual. Um, but at the same time, what happens when we prioritize, well, I would say the notions of anti-blackness or the situation of anti-blackness, or what you could call the kind of, the, the happenings in the interracial streets. Um, we, we tend to pay less attention to something else um, we pay less attention to, or we maybe sometimes even ignore um, not only what happens within the kind of intramural space, um, yes, behind closed doors, um, across dinner tables, um, I guess even between the sheets to a certain extent. Um, but I think also questions around kind of comportment, kind of interior, intersubjective comportment. Um, what well, I would, you know, offer as a kind of way to think that would be some kind of black on black sociality. Um, we would still have to ask, I think we still have to ask what sort of potential violence um, is always circulating um, within that context. Um, I think Hortense would would have certain answers to that, and I think she she, she sort of approaches them um, in this essay. Um, but it's kind of at the level of how do we treat ourselves, um, and what do we feel? How do we talk to each other, and what do we hear? And also, I think principally for for this essay, how do we look at one another, um, and what do we see? Um, all these things, you could say all these things um, and more. Um, that's my kind of extended way to try and sort of um, provide a kind of context from within which I, I approach this essay. Um, I think that approach is, is, uh, is what I've come to understand from my conversations with, 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 with Hortense. Um, and again, I think, you know, the conversations that I've had with her in relation to the intramural and in relation to a question of intimacy and her interest in the intramural and, and these forms of intimacy, um, where they succeed and where they break down um, and how to think about those. Can we develop a language um, to, to do that, um, both at the level of the self, the one, and at some kind of broader um, public level? Um, that's the kind of, I think, um, that's the context within which I approach the 
for me, really, really interesting sort of innovations that I think she's working with. And I think in a way, um, if we're going to think specifically about what happens when we take the notion of the one, for example, and how do we interrelate that with questions that would be pertinent to the field of psychoanalysis? Um, I would want these kind of questions to come with it, right? Um, and I, I sort of say that because I think what's what's uh, what's true of all of her work and is definitely true with, way, with, with, with the way in which she introduces this concept of the one is that it kind of refuses a straightforward conceptual extraction. Um, she, she doesn't necessarily offer a kind of systematic, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear, hear people's thoughts about this. I don't find her notion of the one to be, you know, kind of um, philosophically systematic. Um, it's, it, it arrives on the textual scene um, and kind of refuses to reveal itself in any straightforward, clear way. Um, it is, in a way, slightly hesitant, uncertain, um, um, and it sort of differentiates itself in that moment that, that it arri arises, but it also allows itself to sort of multiply in the way in which it sort of sits with other kind of terms that she, she introduces. Um, so if there's a question of, you know, how do we read this text, from what position, from which field, from what disciplines, for what purposes? Um, and I would say that she would be interested in, in, in thinking about what this text does to the field of psychoanalysis. Um, though I don't think that's her primary concern. Part of the question would be what sort of comes with those terms that might be useful, what, com what comes with um, those those uh, those sections that sort of would be fruitful to to, to look over or to look again at, um, and this this I would call it a kind of prioritizing of all the things, um, all the things and more, um, to not just be baggage, but to sort of be a kind of complex texturing um, of of that kind of thinking of that kind of engagement. Um, I I don't know if I should sort of stop talking now or if um, people want to jump in. Um, Either way, you're welcome. If there's more you you want to say on on if you want to continue this thought, you're very welcome to. But also, um, if it, if you'd rather people kind of direct us to questions and maybe passages also that we can look at, we can do that. Um, so. To you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I've, I've like particular maybe just it is idiosyncratic kind of interest in 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 uh, this text, but um, um, yeah, maybe people can sort of um, jump in and, and 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 sort of get to the points that they want to get to. We can we can maybe have a bit of more fruitful conversation. Yeah, um, I do have a question, but I'm going to see if anyone in the group wants to start, uh, either in the chat or raising your hand. Either way. Okay, maybe I'll I'll start. Um, so when I read this text previously, I kind of got lost in the scene of of her reading of her reading of the Samba case, and um, found it easier to place myself in the in the bookends of the essay which are begin and end in the new world basically like we start in an american church and we end with mingus and american jazz and and um and a kind of blackness that is conditioned by um the transatlantic slave trade but that's not the the scene of the the case that she's reading and i and it's it, that section is more difficult, I think, and it resists uh, a certain kind of synthesis in the way that other parts mm -hmm. don't. Like, e even in a way, I think Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe is an easier text to read because she's in the environment in which she is, uh, or or that she's that she's um, trying to produce a new the, whose interpretive framework she is trying to undo or modify or et 
expand in some way. And I guess I'm wondering, like I, I re when I read the subway case, I want to, I want to um, be able to take away something about a um, real, um, like uh, material and constitutive difference between a certain understanding of pathology and the subject in in the African context and in um, even in Afro diasporic or or particularly New World context. And so I'm like going in there trying to find something and I'm like, maybe it's the fact that guilt and blame are exteriorized and that, um, you know, in that it produces a different kind of sub or I, I, I want to come away with some sort of sense of using the the model that we know of of Oedipus, which, uh, you know, she obviously um, brings in and then thinking about its um, how its application sort of fails or where it needs to be um redrawn in the African context. But I also feel like she doesn't she doesn't totally give us that. Um and I, I guess I'm just wondering how you approach the the Samba case, that that mm -hmm. section. And maybe if you if if uh yeah I, I'm just curious about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm mostly familiar with her writing on on the US really. So it is like a an interesting um, passage, and yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in a way, maybe if I understand you correctly, you're sort of you're sort of asking, like, what is it doing there? <laughs> um, I think I think when I first read this 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 paper, I, I I kind of asked myself the same question. Um, and in part I asked that because, um, you know, I don't just get lost in that section. I get I get sort of get lost in all of it in a way. Um, the kind of the, the the movement of the essay, its its divisions, its repetitions, um, its moving from the registers of of, of complex theoretical kind of discourse down to the level of the anecdotal, um, the kind of speed within which she she entangles all of those. Um, and then she has, you know, this, this, this section near the end, I think it's called section, is it section five? Um, where she deals with, with this question of, of, of this, of Sambasi, the case of Sambasi. Um, so my understanding is that your question is sort of asking, what is it, what is it doing here in a way? Um, or what is she, what is she doing with it? Um, you know, in a way, I don't, I don't want to make a claim that I have, I have an absolute answer to that. Um, but I, I think for me, if, if a central concern for this essay is trying to understand and get at and find a language for the kind of complex um, to uncover the complex differentiated life world of new world black culture or new world um, of the new of the African diaspora in the new world right um, that on the one hand um, the the fictions of, of race cover over um, and reduce to a kind of blankness. Um, um, she sort of speaks about the way in which the individual stands in for the group in this kind of perfect homogeneity. Um, the sort of race covers covers that over. Um, it, it denies the possibility for seeing in, 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 in its complexity. And that there is also a kind of um, extent to which certain black radical formulations might also recapitulate that particular kind of um, flattening. Um, but so she's interested in, in what we might want to call, I don't know, um, the kind of complex interior intersubjective psychic life of of blackness, um, 
in the new world, the question of what happens in the passage through the whole of the slave ship becomes fundamentally important, I think. Um, if there's one question that one would ask, which would be, how do we look at that from, from, from one side of it, right? I think that's part of what you were suggesting in terms of starting and ending, you know, at home, so to speak. Um, in this essay, she sort of says, well, okay, we have to think about passage on the other side of that as well. Um, and I think she gets there because I think she's interested in, I think she's interested in the vertical and the horizontal um, relationality of black life. And that question of, of what are the, what are the kind of complex, difficult, um, at times violent, at times caring um, dimensions to the black experience after this passage, on the other, on the other side of that passage. Um, questions that sometimes one feels as though we shouldn't be asking out loud in public, right? Because we know how, we know how they're used against us. We know how they're used um, within a certain kind of, um, uh, within the language of social science. Um, it kind of produces a kind of racial dialectic in the way in which I think Denise de Silva would say, where um, you already know the outcome, race is destiny, right? Um, um, one's appearance, you know, uh, kind of already describes uh, and gives a kind of um, um, definition to one's social status. Your race kind of predicts um, your social status and your social status can be predicted based on, on, on your race. Um, so we don't kind of wanna say these questions out loud, but I think she would say we have to do that anyway, right? Um, for her to do that, I think she has to sort of ask what happens on, 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 the, on the other side. And that is the question around, I think, the horizontal and the vertical, what happens in relation to um, brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles. And if actually, if we go back to Mama's baby, she is in a way fundamentally interested in the relationship between fathers and daughters, right? Um, um, mothers and, and sons. Um, she's fundamentally interested in what happens when um, the the possibility of a of a present African father gets um, um, sort of eradicated uh, and then replaced with what uh, nothing. Um, so in a way, I think when she when she sort of goes to Samba C, I think that's that's what's kind of like driving that particular particular reading um, and. It's it, it's kind of not clear what she's what what she's concluding from it in a way. Um, is she concluding that we can somehow see uh, a translation from this prior moment of passage to this latter moment? Um, can we read um, black life in the afterlives of of, of of the the middle passage with the kind of um, interesting case study that that she looks at? from the, the, the side of the, the African. I think she kind of does that in a way. Um, and when she talks about the look that comes back, because in a way you sort of, you get to the look when she's talking about Du Bois, she kind of moves away from the look. She says, I want to introduce this idea of the speaking subject, the, the subject that's sort of positioned in discourse, that kind of doubleness that she sort of raises with, with relation to the, to the, to the speaker. Um, and then she sort of returns to the look. So she doesn't entirely disavow looking. And I think she sort of, wants to sort of bring that over into the new world in a way as a way to think that out. Um, but at the same time, I think she's also suggesting that what's interesting about the Samba case is that um, it might be that the, the, the condition that Samba is in is a consequence of a question that he's asking or that his culture cannot answer. And that to me, I think is kind of key in that way because 
what she's interested in is, um, and I think she writes the essay in this particular way, she's interested in possibility, she's interested in, in, in openness. Um, and if race in a way produces like a hermetically sealed, closed, predetermined um, scenario, predicament, um, one's engagement in a kind of self-reflexive, self-definitional, self-attention um, through this interior or internal kind of intersubjectivity that she, she, she uses a kind of ethical protocol. Um, it's about breaking that open again, I think. Um, and so part of it might be that actually this this case from Samba C shows that we have to give in to the possibility that the, the culture that we're in cannot answer the questions that we need to have answered. Um, and how do we work work through that? I mean, that, I don't know if that's kind of answering very sufficiently. Yeah. Um, no, that last part helps a lot. And it, yeah, and and is, yeah, I guess it is something that um, com comes up directly in the text that she says, like, um, like, can the culture to which this problem addresses itself provide the answer or something like that? Um, I'm just going to read a question from the chat from Sam. Uh, I'm interested in the recourse to Habermas in the essay and in Spillers' preference for classical Freudian psychoanalysis, unconscious becomes preconscious through a narrative act. I'm also interested in what seems to be what what seems to have becoming discursive of psychoanalysis in her argument, one that seems to take the cure out of the talking cure, such that talking or poesis slash rhetorics of the self of the community is all that remains, alongside perhaps a style of listening and attaining to the free associations of Mingus jazz that means nothing but produces something. Um, so this is more of like a, a provocation, I guess, than a question. And it's responding to uh, th this question of um, what this text does uh, to or for psychoanalysis and if psychoanalysis has uh, symbolic capital. Mm. Great question. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm, not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm qualified to. I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer in a way. Um, I wonder if anyone wants to jump in um, and, and, and give give that a go in a way. Um, yeah, I, I think she's not interested in the cure. I think that's I think that's definitely true. Um, and I think she's um, she's uh, she's she's using. I'm going to try and bring up the question actually. Um, it's just in the chat if you can yeah yeah um i think she's she's um she's using psychoanalysis in a very different way you know so i think if if one of the differences between her and fanon is you know fanon and she mentions the text in fanon you know, was practicing um so not only not only is he interested in, in cures as such he's also interested in a certain kind of psychoanalytic practice um or, or the, even sort of the space within which that might happen which could be the kind of the the, the, the clinic so to speak um I don't think she's 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 interested in that actually at all. Um, and the question around um, language, you know, it's a complex one. And I, you know, I, I, I wonder, Sam, if you want to jump in. Um, um, but you know, I think the, the 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 point that she's sort of getting to is um, there's a certain kind of muteness. That is being um, that has been imposed um, on black communities in the new world, specifically in the ways in which you know a kind of prohibition to to reading and writing um, was 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 you know emblematic of the the, the, the black code, so to speak, um, a kind of denial of, of literacy, and even in some sense being able to speak. So if if in a way there's a kind of um, question of the the speaking and the talking as, as part of a kind of taking for grantedness um, within the kind of psych psychoanalytic field, I think she um, she comes at it from a slightly different different angle. Um, um, yeah, Mingus and Jazz. Um, um, I mean, I I when I. When I thought about that, you know, for me, I asked the question, you know, how does the question of this thing that means nothing relate to questions of the negative negation and negativity? And I, I, I don't think that the text necessarily settles in a way. Um, 
And for me, it was interesting that we get to, to nothing at the end. Um, it, it's strange because it actually sort of speaks in a way that it feels like it was written only five years ago and, and not so more or less 30. But, but that's in me still attention, actually. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I can sort of, um, you know, resolve that uh, in, in a way um, in, in the text. It, it comes out in, in, in complex formulations, but um, it's definitely there as a, as, as a tension. And again, I think that tension is in relation, comes out in relation to Fanon um, as well. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Thanks, Matthew. This is really great. I mean, I I, I kind of just wanted to like riff or like dilate on a, a handful of things. I um recently reread uh, Fanon's critique of Manoni, uh, and his first book, and and then kind of right after that, we watched part of a documentary that all did uh, about Fanon, and in it, he says this kind of interesting thing that. I found kind of puzzling, which was he said, like basically that Fanon was more unwittingly Oedipal than he would let on in his critique of Manoni, because part of his critique of Manoni is that there's a kind of European Oedipalization process that really just misses the forest for the trees of the clinical problems that Manoni was trying to diagnose. And when when Hall says that in the in the documentary, I was I was like, I was like, well, I, I thought about this essay, this particular essay by Spillers. And I thought, because that's what, you know, what she's reckoning with on some level is trying to ask that question about, you know, uh, a European Oedipus or an African Oedipus or whatever. But, then I, but, then I, but when I reread it for this for this seminar, I, 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 I had made it more binary in my head than it actually is, which is like to say like, oh, well, all of Europe has these Oedipal problems and yet there's a different sort of historical configuration to contend with otherwise. And that's not quite what she's saying. I kind of realized on this this I it seems to me at least in my reading of it here and I guess I wanted to read a passage that I wanted to kind of like just hear from you about and then and hear about these kind of thematics in that respect clinically or otherwise like I don't think it matters but I think like for sure for Fanon like the the Manoni thing is about a clinical problem um, but this passage right here that she writes where it's on 732 in the text I have but um she writes, the, uh, the slave trade, of course, bears none of the advantages of myth, which shows some of its earmarks as the Atlantic trade might be thought of as one of the founding events of modern history and economy. But for our purposes here, the execrable trade in radically altering the social system and old and new world domestic community is as violent and disruptive as the never did happenstance of mythic and oniric inevitability. In other words, this historical event, like a myth, marks so rigorous a transition in the order of things that it launches a new way of gauging time and human origin. It underwrites, in short, a new genealogy defined by a break with tradition, with a capital T, with the law, with capital L, of the ancestors, with a capital A, and the paternal intermediary. Um, and I guess that kind of like, that passage really like, I don't know, it's at the heart of this question in, in many respects. Um, and I guess I just wanted to underline one part of it that I found that I found really fascinating this this last time through reading it which is that like it's like in the place of myth history becomes itself the myth but it doesn't have the same kind of qualities that freud would otherwise characterize that as. and i guess i'm wondering how much that bears upon the question upon like a european oedipus or what however we might describe that symbolic matrix that's mm -hmm. my question actually is that when history becomes itself the the positing of human origins, what does that do for us at the level of like making these more structural metapsychological determinations? Does that make mm -hmm. sense as a question, Matthew? Yeah, I think I think so. And it's um, I I'm using um I'm using a different um, version. I'm using from the the version of the text from um from the collection of essays. So I can't quite find um the section which which um section yeah, is this one. Yeah, let me find it. It's it's in the first section, actually, towards the end of the first section. It's right before the paragraph that begins, from my perspective, then, African Oedipus. Yeah. Mm 
Um, it's a one, two, uh, three paragraphs up from the beginning of the second section. I'm oh, sorry, I can't actually. Where are you? I think we might be using two different versions of it because I, I think the one you all circulated was the shorter version from Critical Inquiry. Okay, maybe that, the the one in the book, right, is is much longer. I think it's uh, five section. So, okay, maybe I quoted from something we didn't read. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, I think that you're quoting from what we. What we was shared in the in the file, but she, in in the, I think you're probably look, using the collection of essays, right? That I am, yeah. yeah so that oh, has right, the okay. version of this is very is very long. The critical inquiry one is a shorter. I think it's a condensed version of it, perhaps. Oh, yeah. oh right, okay. Um, that well, that explains. It. I was I was. <laughs> I was impressed that everyone was going to read. I, when the, the suggestion was to read this essay, I thought, "Christ, this is." I mean, it's, it's long for Hortes, essay. It's also long because it's so difficult. Um, yeah. uh, oh, that kind of makes sense. I, I think it's in a different. Um, I think it's in a different. Um, in a different spot uh, for, for me, actually. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a. It's a it's an interesting question because um, I mean you're you're referring to a comment that Stuart Hall makes um, in the in the documentary, right? Just to stage it, basically, but yeah, because it, it it got me thinking about it when when he said it. Where you you know, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like yeah. basically like. Fanon's more unwittingly edible than he's letting on. And I and I wondered about that, you know, um, you know, what that means. And it just it reminded me of this essay. Yeah, the if, that, if that's the Isaac Julian film, right? I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I remember I, th I think I remember that scene. Um and if if I remember correctly, um Stu I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but there's, there's a kind of, I wonder if there's something playful. Yes, yes. I mean, he's being ironic, um, I think, when he says it. Yeah. Totally, yes. Yeah, there's something there's something kind of ironic and playful. Um, uh, there's something kind of almost um, familial or sort of fraternal um, in the way in which he says it. Um, which is to say, one one doesn't know how seriously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if one doesn't know how seriously, or or what would be the the level of seriousness in which to to take to take Stuart Hall in this. And I I I, I if, if my memory serves me correctly, I sort of remember that um, with with a kind of laugh, a chuckle. There's a kind of closing of the eyes from Stuart Hall. Um, I think he's enjoying the moment. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, which, which to me comes back to, to well, a number of things. One, I think the question would be, um, do we want to psychoanalyze Fanon through his writing? Um, I, I think I have a kind of dispositional. Um, uh, defense mechanism against that, right? Um, or rather, one, one can use it, I think, in playful ways, um, which is different, I think, to sort of actually trying to sort of use that as a reading practice. Um, and so, at least sort of, sort of respond to that kind of specific kind of um, um, context, which I'm glad you raised. 
um, because it's a brilliant film actually. Um, and it's, it's again, also brilliant because of, of Stuart Hall's um, presence in it. Um, that it kind of reminds me of the, it kind of reminds me of this section five actually. Um, ha, what is the way in which Stuart Hall is looking with and at Fanon? Um, is there is there a kind of it's not an insult it's not a it's not a diss uh, it's not quite the dozens in the way in which I think Hortense sort of raises the dozens at the end um, but there's a there's something else going on there which I actually find really interesting um, and, and in, a, in a sense it is again thinking about what are the kind of ways in which we could read these um, um, rhythms of, of 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 sort of intramural sociality, even when that happens not at the level of one's living brothers as such, but but in this kind of complex relationship to to um, those who might provide us with some kind of authorization, you know, hmm. um, someone that we could have would want to claim, and hopefully would we would want them to claim us. Um, to be claimed by them at the same time, um, who we fight over, um, and and it's kind of it's sort of on that level that I actually find kind of interesting to think about it, um, especially when I think about Stuart Hall's relationship to Fanon, that given that that particular historical moment, which is to say, given that his that moment within which Fanon was being read. Um, um, quite productively i think that film's from the mid to late 90s um that's the kind of era where you have the kind of homie barbers um um writing and thinking um, a lot about fanon but the kind of the 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 the, the kind of relationship that, that sort of appears between a barber and a fanon and a stew hall and a fan is different and it might be actually that it's that kind of does Baba come in? Is he in the film as well? Is I, think, in the film? I think so. I think he is. I think he is. I mean, if memory serves, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a, I don't know, maybe. Hmm. There's, um, there's a, there's a kind of color to that, the, that sort of moment where, where Stuart Hall is thinking about Fanon there's, that is also critical. Um, um, that, doesn't doesn't happen when, in relationship to to Barbara. Um, um, I think for me that would be the kind of way in which I would sort of uh, read 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 that. Um, the question of myth is um, is a, is a difficult one as well. I think um, um, in part because I think you know Hortense has a has a um, has a kind of ambivalent relationship to myth. Um, and some of the ways in which he uses myth in this text sort of, I think, are surprising um, and in some sense run run a little bit sort of along different tracks than actually uses it in uh, in other texts, specifically um, uh, Mama's Baby. Um, so so I, I still kind of want to find a way to actually sort of understand um, that, that relationship um, around myth. Um, but it is a remarkable. I wish I could find the passage. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm not reading the same the same text as you because it um, it would be better if I could sort of actually look at it and and, and follow it um, again. But uh, but it is that kind of the kind of radicalness of the situation um, and how it relates to um, um, a kind of structuring discourse um, that one is always pushing against and fighting fighting against. The thing that, 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 that sort of occurs to me is that she, she ends the, the essay on this. I hope it's in my copy and in your copy. Um, but there's almost a way in which I think she she seems to be suggesting um, a kind of discursive resourcefulness to, yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, that was for, was for me a kind of surprise. Um, mm -hmm. And if, if there's at times I think there's a kind of divergence between Hortense Spillers on the one hand and someone like Sylvia Winter on the other. That was a moment that I thought kind of um, 
uh, showed a kind of um, uh, yeah, kind of a kind of closeness. Um, um, I, I don't know if that was a, a a productive way to answer the question. Yeah, no, it absolutely was. I mean, I think I I just think. Um... I don't know. These are my questions when I, when I when I think about this text. I guess I just think about particularly the stuff about myth and, and history and and to, and to what extent they're entangled. You know, I think that because I think to some extent that it definitely bears on clinical questions, but they, it also bears upon the thing you're saying about with like the discursive resourcefulness. Like, what can we avail ourselves of in terms of narratives or conceptual narratives in order to yeah, I get close. I get, I get, I get, I get, I guess get like experience near, you know, to the way people articulate themselves for sure, but then also articulate themselves at the limits of that, which is part of what psychoanalysis brings. Um, but then I, yeah, and I'm just, and I'm, and I always, I always kind of struggle with like trying to find a, I don't know, a settled place around how to think about Freud's own kind of myths. I mean, Oedipus included, but but of course also the primal myths too, like especially as they bear upon the unfolding of this. Mm -hmm. We actually mm -hmm. take them up. Do they do they really bear upon these these the psychical contours of things? And if we take history, the radicalness of history, I think is I love that phrase. I mean, um, as itself psychically preponderant, you know, what do we do then? And and how do we address ourselves to those historical events in that respect? Um, in which ones and why? You know that 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 really, I don't know that that entanglement always seems really productive for me. Yeah. Um, no, I think that. yeah, I think you're right. Um, and definitely, sort of when you when you sort of read um, um, the the ways in which you know, Freud thinks through um, these kind of universalized. Um, fictions yeah. um specifically in relation to, to to the father um to the primal ward um what's if, if that in a way is frustrating for those who would feel as though they're somehow outside of that particular um framing um what's shocking in a sense what's shocking remains shocking um is that the the scene upon which um this kind of Oedipal moment occurs maybe in the kind of long jure um historical memory for 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 black folks in the new world um is is kind of between history and myth right um and the, the fact that she sort of refers back to um um the middle passage specifically as kind of a Getting entangled, um, the, the 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 history itself actually sort of produces the text within within myth um, do, does so much of its damage. Mm. Um, mm. Um, can myth be be um, refashioned away from the ways in which it produces race and ethnicity as a kind of destiny? Mm. Um, I don't know. To be honest with you, um, I suspect. I suspect Judy would have, have have some kind of thoughts on that, specifically because the way in which he reads the flesh in in the context of of, of uh, Holland Bart's no notions of of myth and mythologies. Um, but it's a uh, it's a kind of terrifying thought, I think, for me. Um, mm. I don't know what else. Um, I'm going to get to these questions in one second. I just want to add on this uh, question of myth and history that uh, I think one thing that made this text particularly challenging for me is that she doesn't offer a particular historical moment that could explain why a particular kind of subject is not, um, cannot um, avail itself of, of the interpretive framework of psychoanalysis. And in Mama's Baby Papa's, maybe it's so clear with something like Partis Separator Ventrum, which is a a real material law that dispossesses the the child of the slave woman of um or or of dispossesses the child of um the possibility of inheriting land from the slave master father and therefore fundamentally changes the the way um maternity takes on a, a social symbolic function 
And I think, um, yeah, the, the, um, I, the, yeah, the, the, the African, I was, I was wanting more, um, of a, of a, I guess a positive, um, mm. of positing some sort of, uh, material historical, um, um, incident that is not assimilable to the the hermeneutics of of the subject of psychoanalysis and that doesn't totally come through because because she's actually just doing a close reading of this other text but then i thought maybe we should read that text in the seminar at some point because it seems uh it it's never really come up for me in in uh my reading of these literatures and yet uh she's working so closely with it so i thought maybe we can also send that around and then at some point in another seminar get to it um but yeah go ahead brian yeah i think continuing on this topic and thinking about i was i was actually trying to find the passage that alex had in, in our version in in the book but i, I also can't it's too long <laughs> i don't know uh, right but one of the things i was thinking about around the question of history and myth is that one of the things that's happening in the African Oedipus and this sort of ethno psychoanalytic project is a kind of interpolating of the African subject into the Oedipus complex, right? And then doing a kind of clinical diagnosis of it. And that's what Fanon in part, in part is rejecting, right? That you, that you can't, and then making the claims and something like black skin, white masks that, you know, there at that one point where he says there is no Oedipus in the, in the crib. I can't remember the exact passage. And then the footnote somewhere, he says, kind of agrees with Lacan, but then he reads history into the unconscious and into the, into the symbolic. Right. And it seems to me that in this, what Spillers is trying to do is take that critique, but then almost entirely disagree with Fanon and say, it's not that Oedipus is um, not available, but that there's this historical moment of the transatlantic slave trade that is is a cut, right? And then and then it becomes and so while she's certainly not agreeing with the with the African Oedipus or, or taking it sort of face value, but saying it's kind of mediating term between the sort of myth of Oedipus, which it doesn't seem like she's quite giving up on the sense of there being a, a universal. I don't think is the right word, but but being something like that that then that it is mythic, that is mediated then by a historical event. And this historical event, I think one could say, has um, uh, various or, or, or uh, losing track of a word here, but um, uh, sort of various repercussions globally, but that it mediates that moment so that you, she doesn't give up on myth, right? And But that there's a historical moment, a kind of cut in that myth. So that one can't, you can't just apply Oedipus globally like Freud would have wanted to do. I think Fanon in that moment is just, you know, is an echo of the the critiques from Malinowski in the 1920s, right? Not everybody has Oedipus. And you get the other, you know, Ernest Jones and others saying like, sure, but you wouldn't say that one has a teacher complex and this Oedipus can have very various. I don't think that's what Spillers is doing at all, but I think that's what Fanon is saying, right? That you know, Oedipus is, if if anything, it's for it's a European scenario, and it seems like to me Spillers is trying to read that in a, mu in a much more sort of sophisticated and, and complicated way that gives us myth and history. Um, so I, I don't know if that made sense, but that's what I was sort of thinking as Alec, you and Alex were having a conversation. So that's the kind of sort of discursive resourcefulness or that that's going on in 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 um, in Spillers here. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Thanks that, Brian. That's um, that was really wonderful. Um, and I think, in a way, it kind of is also sort of linked up to Wendy. Your your question. Um, it felt like an answer, in some sense, to to, to your question um, about what might be the kind of um, barrier um, to the psychoanalytic um, for for Black New World subjects. Because um, I, I think, in a way. She, she's saying, well, maybe we haven't yet bothered to do that work um, and to think through that sort of carefully. Um, and if that work has been done at all in any sustained way within black critical thinking, it's, it's at the level of the 
the kind of um, prime uh, the literary writers of of the African American canon. I think those are the things that she's 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 sort of focusing on. Um, that's where some of that work has been being done, but but it, it's the message is still somehow um, uh, difficult to read, and and we have to still do the work of kind of um, providing a reading of that kind of complex fictional kind of um, investigation. Um, I mean, that's definitely how I how I approach all of those texts, and you know, when I think about Du Bois and and, and his own kind of uh, fictional writing, I think that's definitely um, part part of my engagement. Um, and I think she's offering that in, in this in this um, in this text, with all the kind of caveats and complications um, um, that that she moves through. Um, and I think in a in one way, it's uh, it's probably not even a controversial kind of critique. We should just say that you know the, the, the subject of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis in some ways. Um, is, is too one-dimensional um, because it took for granted certain things that are not are not applicable in the lived lived experience of, of, of new York, of black folks. Um, simply, in some sense, being at home in, in one's environment um, or or being from a kind of milieu that is sort of uh, um, somewhat kind of understandable or kind of a bourgeois kind of milieu that I think she's critiquing that then produces itself um, as a kind of overrepresentation. Um, that we can actually break that up. And we can we can apply some kind of like pressure to it, and, um, uh, find something useful in, in, that, in that process. And that's I think kind of what, what she's what, what she's doing. Um, so I wonder in that context, she doesn't necessarily need to kind of like um, uh, skewer or kind of um, reveal or or circle around in any kind of very explicit way, um, a kind of particular legal formulation um, as you described that she does in in, in Mama's Baby. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nam, do you wanna, um, I saw you had your hand up before and now um, put something in the chat. Do you wanna um, ask or uh, I can also just read what you wrote aloud. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think Selma Terafe addresses the, this question of the Oedipal in the Black, like really with a lot of nuance in her writing. Um, like she engages spillers, both Mama's Baby and all the um, Freud essay um, <clears throat> through and using spillers to critique Marriott and Fanon, um, thinking about like her, her work on the objected Black female imago. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that might get to, I don't know, a, a more nuanced understanding of spillers maybe. Um, but yeah, speaking the hieroglyph is great. Also, I wanted to ask about like um, spillers and language. Um, and like, I, I'm, I'm thinking of like, just the, when in the mama's baby, when she kind of outlines the, the, the semiosis, right. Or the, the semiosis procedure that, um, that <clears throat> like allows for the, the, for the ungendering kind of, um, um, is is kind of based on this kind of sign that can be iterably transferred from one generation to another um, that and that she calls that the vestibularity of flesh, right? Like the vestibular fresh to culture. Um, so I'm trying to think about how that relates to her theory of language here as like, um, yeah, in this essay um, where she kind of thinks about um, how critical theory and psychoanalysis both take language for granted. Um, and so what does that mean for the the efficacy of Black speech? Uh, what does that mean for uh, the interior intersubjectivity as like a structural restoration of speech and, and language, right? And I'm borrowing from Calvin Warren's reading of Spillers here. But I've always been kind of perplexed by or 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 interested in like her theory of, of grammar and language throughout Mama's Baby, this article and the article in the interst interstices as well. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's um that's a great um series of questions. Um I wonder if I'm if I might ask you 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 because I think it might be useful you you sort of um raised spillers uh in in 
in relation to a possible critique of Fanon and Marriott. Um, would you feel comfortable kind of elaborating a little bit more on, on that? Um, yeah, like I, uh, the Tarafe wrote about this in speaking of the hieroglyph and also in her dissertation project, but she kind of thinks about uh, how Marriott like engages spillers in kind of straw man critique um, of like her notion of mimesis um, in the, um, I think that's in Mama's Baby um, and how like my, a lot of Merritt's Irv, especially who were his work in like racial fetishism, right? Where he's talking about how the black is no Oedipus. These kind of things are are very reliant on spillers, but he doesn't really cite her very much. Um, so yeah, so kind of um, Tarafe thinks about how this kind of leads to thinking about the, the, the role of the black female imago in the the construction of the psychosexual afterlife of slavery, right? Like has as you know something that is is like you know um, that that is subject to both like white and black scopic pleasures and like she, she's always thinking about like this from like a intramural register too, right? And and so um, yeah, I, I I'm not uh, I wouldn't dare to uh relay her work in more detail here but yeah everyone should check that article out if you haven't mm. mm. yeah no i think you i think you did a i think you did a good um a good a good job at um sort of outlining the ways in which um the the hieroglyphics um, of the flesh, um, the markings on the body um, that register um, a certain kind of powerlessness um, to to ward off someone else's um, touch, um, which you know under these conditions would would, would somehow be violent, right? Um, even if even if some context in some context one would want to claim that there's some something else going on there. Um, that that these kind of markings end up becoming a kind of syntax that that produces a kind of uh, false um, alignment between skin color, um, race, um, and a kind of um, inherent predisposition towards certain practices or an inherent predisposition um, um, that limits certain practices right um, and and so we we have this kind of covering over that um, the kind of way in which she talks about race in this text and the way in which she talks about um, uh, the body and the flesh in in moments there's a kind of overlapping language which I find quite interesting I think the, the kind of phrases uh, um, um, something like the brush of discourse and the reflexes of iconography um, that kind of cover over um, um, the flesh. Um, and race is, is some other way in which I think she would describe that, that, that process. Um, such that when we, we when, when, when we, when we see race, it sort of always, always has this kind of parent um, uh, matter of factness. Um, we always think we know exactly what we're seeing when we see it, um, and thus uh, it kind of it almost comes before us without a kind of without ability to have to do anything. Um, but uh, but she kind of historicizes that, right? Uh, and I think that's really really well put. Um, I also think, in a way, for me, one has to ask the question, and I, I don't know if I've come to any strong conclusions on this, but you know, where does the hieroglyphics of the flesh relate to epidermalization um, in the way in which Fanon would, would raise it? And um, you know, I suspect if you're doing kind of very fine-tuned reading, you know, one one could see um, some kind of tension there, but I, I think they definitely overlap, right? Um, so that kind of the terms are useful, useful as as kind of um, being being interchangeable. Um, that becomes one way in which you can think about the grammar, right? The syntax, the the the, the discourse, the, the discursive practices of, of of racialization and race in in, in the new world. Um, yeah, this question of of language is is also really really interesting for me because I 
I mean, I, I think I would say that, you know, from from the, the more Afro-pessimist perspectives, um, there will be a claim that there is no, there's no speech app that the, the so-called black can, can produce that can't be sort of stolen or, or, or kind of abused or reused um, for the psychic health of the human, um, that um, culture and cultural production, both with language and, and in some other form, um, has no capacity to intervene in that context, right? Um, I, I don't think that's what Spillers is saying here. You know, um, I don't think she's saying that. And yet at the same time, I was thinking about this over the last few days and, well, I think it's a question that doesn't just relate to, 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 to black subjects or to the to, to black personality. Um, but I think it's a kind of primary one for, for that. In a way, I think it also, one could include other um, communities within this kind of question. And if, if said, um, uh, Sexton would talk about the kind of the lack of a certain kind of ontological reach um, that, that, that the black has. In this instance, I sort of wanted to rephrase that through this reading that Spillers gives us and, and, and speak, speak about kind of discursive reach. Um, and she seems to be uninterested in kind of reading purely from within the field of ontology. Um, I think that's part of how she's she's pushing back on 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 the boys. Um, so if we're going to put ontology to to one side, so to speak, what would it mean to talk about discursive reach? Um, what would it mean to sort of um, um, have access to a certain kind of language that can do certain kinds of work, um, that can have certain kinds of effects, um, that could be sent um, in particular ways, um, and that might maybe even land um, to be received in particular ways. Um, and that the question of legibility and illegibility there, I think, is, is, is definitely part of it. Some things can be maybe even to, to, the, to the extent a bit incommensurable there. Um, I think for me, that's one area within which I think it's kind of productive to think about speaking and, and, and talking and, and writing and literacy in this context. Um, but I can't, I also, I can't help but think, um, I can't help but think about the current, the current crisis that we're, we're sort of witnessing. Um, there is a way in which I think thinking about um, these particular questions start to um, interlo interlocate with, with with the question of Palestine, actually, um, and 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 how might, might this formulation be useful in thinking about the questions of discursive reach or the lack of a certain kind of discursive reach um, um, in that context? I, I find I, I sort of find productive. Um, and I will admit, I will admit, like part of my kind of returning to this essay was is is you know under the under the kind of sign of of, of, of this particular kind of crisis slash catastrophe. And she talks about crises in this text, so it didn't it didn't feel totally um, um, unfair. And so again, we're seeing I think um, that kind of repetition on the one hand, um, the failure of of or the refusal to allow a certain kind of discursive reach. For a whole a whole population, um, at the same time as um, um, forms of ruination um, are kind of reproducing themselves um, towards something like the given. You know, um, there's a kind of strange repetition there, a kind of painful repetition there. Um, so. So it's it's a very kind of um, it feels like a very live question, um, and I is it is it now? I, I thank you for it. Thank you. That's a good answer. I, maybe I can say one more thing. The other thing for me is um, um, what 
what do we what do we do about it? You know, um, it feels like a, a naive question, um, but um, what do we make of it? What do we what do we do about it? I think I think I sort of want to come back to and um, I, I think Mary would have very different a very different answer to that, and I think he has a very different reading of maybe it's a very different reading of Fanon, but um, you know one there's there's a way in which the kind of the vertiginous isn't really present um, in, in 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 this particular um, reading, um, and the kind of the question of bringing someone up to the brink or, or, or moving a kind of community towards the brink, um, that's a kind of different articulation. Um, um, there the, the are kind of elements in this essay where I think she, you know Hortense is kind of doing something interesting that is really to one side of. Of, of of that particular formulation, um, and I personally feel I'm, I'm I remain ambivalent about it. Mm. Um, and if if ambivalence is one way to to think through, um, um, at least from a kind of certain Du Boisian lens, a kind of um, a black lived experience, and I think it's okay to somehow remain ambivalent about what, where Spiller sits in relation to 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 a Marriott. Um, and at the same time. Um, the, the 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 text isn't replete with conclude concluding remarks. The text isn't kind of definitive. Um, the, the text, all the things, doesn't sort of um, um, sort of return us to kind of givens. Um, I'm amazed at how many question marks there are in this in this um, in this in this essay. And actually, a lot of the the, the, the Sentence, sentence structures I had to reread because I realized I was actually a question on the statement. Some of the times I think she, I think she's making a statement, um, but it's actually a question. Um, and in in that instance, if we take seriously this this uh, this notion of a kind of interior intersubjectivity, um, the kind of the, the doubleness of the duality, um, or maybe the more than more than doubleness of the one, um, and the kind of the, the kind of imperative to think about the the group in a kind of complex internal differentiated way, not not under the sign of homogeneity, then I don't think maybe we have to necessarily choose um, in any outright sense between um, um, the ways in which I think Spillers would want to put discursive reach, if I could sort of impose that as a, as a, as a way to think about this text, to, to, to use discursive reach in this particular way, as opposed to um, some kind of um, vertiginous leap towards some other form of kind of um, collective political action. Um, right. I, I don't know if we just have to choose um, um, but, but between them, if we can see them as being part of a kind of broader um, um, on ensemble of, of, of attempts at getting at something complex and, and maybe even, um, you know, always slightly out of reach. Mm. I, I, um, I don't really want to, I was just going to say something real quick because I, I don't want it to go unrecognized or underrecognized, but I just wanted to say that the thing you just said about the, the repetition about ruination being a, a given and that's something that demands an answer to or a response to, not an answer. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to say that I, I found that very moving and um, to me worth acknowledging because it because it definitely is in the in in the contours of this text. Absolutely, I agree with you there. Um, and um, I think I don't know being pushed to the brink where there is this discursive reach, but doesn't quite I don't know inculcate a response that's adequate to that 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 feels really that feels really real to me uh, um in a way that i find a bit i i don't have the language for it uh life shattering yes but then also just a kind of inability i think to i don't know just to just to reflect on what you're saying like even the level of the grammar of the text like it makes for a situation where implacable statements with no questions is like the only grammar that becomes possible. 
and it's i don't know the texture of that is very hard to live with i think um and i think i just wanted i don't know i just didn't want it to go unrecognized i think that what you had mm -hmm. said was extremely resonant um at least for me um so i just wanted to respond to that mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think um, I think it's this one clear difference between um, Fanon and Spillers in the way in which we we come to them textually in, in this text. It it is some somehow in this notion of Negro phobogenesis, um, and I love. Genuinely love the way in which she approaches that that moment in the text. Um, you you get access to um, her own, um, I would say, like prolonged, um, like self reflection. Um, I think she she performs um, a kind of uh, interior into subjectivity in the way in which she arri arrives at this notion of, of negro phobogenesis or phobo the, the the black as a kind of phobogenic object um from from Fernand. um it we're going to get to it where she talks about um i don't know if you it's it's very very soon after the the beginning of the second second part um uh, where she talks about the slight stir um um, the slight stir that his slash her appearance has caused in places. Um, um, the, what does she say? Um, he's talking about the, the, the essence of visibility um, in relation to the African and it being a marked position. I think this marked position again goes back to the previous question around syntax and and um and the kind of markings literally on 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 the body and the flesh um of the captive um this marked position and she says trouble comes double when race determines a marker for the person who has it this is not exactly tautological or question begging as the process, phenotypic assignment recognition over and against a spurt of psychic energy interconnect with the actual presence of the black person who gratefully under normal circumstances remains oblivious to the slight stir that her slash his appearance has caused in places. Um, I mean, one would have to ask, what does normal, <laughs> what does normal do here? And the fact that it's under erasure, I think, is really significant. Um, and in some ways, the kind of the the cleverness and and also the kind of the humor of the the sentence is that um, to be gratefully under normal circumstances, oblivious to one's slight stir. To be able to write that sentence, one cannot be oblivious to it, right? One knows it, um, even under so-called normal circumstances. Um, then we get this question of the Negro and Antilles in relation to um, Fanon and um, the kind of phobogenic object. And I think actually, Um, the difference would be that if she recognizes the usefulness of the term or the, the kind of construction here, you know, the Negro as a phobogenic object, a stimulus to anxiety, I think the difference would be that Fanon would claim um, that the black person also embodies that or reproduces that, that it's the kind of the question of this of self aversion. Um, and that produces a kind, I, I would say that kind of like leads toward a certain kind of reading where one has to um, um, contend with that. Um, that might be the brink upon which one has to move um, 
before something can be done. Um, um, I just don't think Spillers believes that at all. Um, or it might be that she doesn't believe it for herself and she doesn't believe it as a as a as a generalizable ontological condition of, of, of black folk. Um, and I think if that's the case, then there are other things available. Um, there are other other kind of processes, practices, methods available, I think, um, um, start to open up for her, um, which I think this, this essay is kind of trying to, to, to give us as, as something like the, a kind of horizon of possibility. Thank you, Matthew. That was, um, yeah, extremely uh, helpful and beautiful and um, so grateful uh, for you coming in and thinking with us. Um, and uh, I apologize for there being two versions, one uh, condensed and one full, um, but I have the a PDF of the black, white, and in color. And so the the version that appears in that collection, which I believe is the collection that right, you're reading from Black, White, and Color, that now is in the um, Google Drive. So for those who want to go into the longer form, um, it's there. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, as as we said at the beginning, next week with uh, Gabe Wynan, um, we'll be um, talking about emotional labor. Um, and yeah, thanks. Yes, emphasis on chapter seven for those who uh, are pressed for time. Um, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank that you was... so much. Seriously, it was, uh... was a... Yes, thank you so, so much. As I said, it was a kind of fraught pleasure, but it was definitely um, definitely a pleasure. And again, also the questions were were, were, were really, for me, really productive. Um, and um, I hope I hope the kind of conversation was was also productive for, for everyone here too. Very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll write to you, Matthew. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.